Hi, welcome. Still adjusting to this mic here. And thank you to the organizers for bringing this conference together. And in terms of the context, the prior my co-presenter provided regarding the lead up to the Olympic Games in 1968 in Mexico City, I'm talking about a different theme, a different event that happened with African American athletes on the Olympic dais after the 200 meter final on October 16th, 1968. We often forget that the Summer Olympics in 1968 were held in October, so that's something that I always remind myself. And in terms of iconic images, as you can see, the program itself is graced with uh, this iconic image of resistance and black power and is so appropriate for framing this discussion and a lot of my analysis will be grounded in an understanding of these images and the power of these images and how they help us think through and understand how we approach resistance, both in 1968 and 2016, which I will address that date. That might seem odd at first, but as I discuss the timeline and the story of each of these events, it will make more sense. And before proceeding, I also want to read a quick quote to, again, Speaking of this theme of grounding and framing our understandings of what these events of iconic resistance continue to mean and as they are still in many ways unfolding, especially regarding Colin Kaepernick and other African-American NFL players continuing to take a stand by taking a knee, is that Toni Morrison says that spectacle is the best means by which an official story is formed and is a superior mechanism for guaranteeing its longevity, and I think this speaks to that, that idea of guaranteeing longevity is 50 years on, we're still talking about this event. So, so a few images, and as we're thinking about media coverage, and I clarify this as well, I'm looking at print media, which in our current era is a more contested term than ever. What is actually, what's print media? Right, is newspapers, okay, they all have digital editions, magazines, so I'm primarily looking at newspapers and magazines and for continuity, specifically looking at publications that were in existence and circulation both in 1968 and in 2016. But here is the cover of Newsweek from July 15th, 1968 um, with Tommy Smith and you can see the caption of the angry black athlete. So this is a couple of months before the 1968 Olympic Games, so a prescient image and a prescient story. And I'll talk more about the Olympic Project for Human Rights, sociology professor Harry Edwards' role as the principal architect of the OPHR at San Jose State, which is where both Tommy Smith and John Carlos attended and ran track. But again, it was this, that feeling of 68, that air was already, already unfolding before they stepped onto the dais. And this image itself, I'll spend some more time addressing the story behind it. But of course, uh, we see Tommy Smith, who won the gold, and John Carlos, who won the bronze, and also Peter Norman of Australia, who took the silver medal in that event and has a kind of fascinating story unto him himself. And he actually died in 2006, and both Carlos and Smith eulogized him, served as pallbearers, and he also wore an Olympic Project for Human Rights pin. He was absolutely in support of their message, their demonstration, and did pay a personal and professional price upon returning to Australia as well. So I wanted to put that out there as early media coverage, especially in 1968, Norman was used as a kind of foil to Carlos and Smith to say this is how you should behave, right? And obviously when you learn more about the story of Norman, and he was absolutely in support of Carlos and Smith's iconic demonstrations. So I'll tell a little bit more about that story first, but I want us to have that image sort of lingering with us for a moment. And of course, in contrasting with Colin Kaepernick taking a knee, and this is from October 3rd, 2016, the cover of Time magazine. And as you can see, it's a little bit challenging with the reproduction of this image, but the caption uh, reads, the perilous fight. National anthem protests led by Colin Kaepernick are fueling a debate about privilege and patriotism. So it's a different type of framing, and that's ultimately what I am arguing is the different treatment of Carlos and Smith and then Kaepernick, and it has a lot to do with structure and the seismic shifts 
that have occurred in terms of our media system. And so we're talking about discourse, we're also talking about structure. I'm thinking of Todd's comments from last night too, right? We're not just talking about discourse as disconnected from structure, but really thinking about the context structurally in both 1968 and 2016. And again, moving forward, I wanted to bring up this image, and this is just some interventions I wanted to make at the outset before diving more deeply into the analysis. This is the cover of the New Yorker magazine from January 15th, 2018. You may be familiar with this. And we see Colin Kaepernick depicted with Martin Luther King Jr. and uh, Michael Bennett from the Seattle Seahawks, who's a defensive end, who's also been outspoken about the need for racial justice in the United States. And I think that this image is important in terms of thinking about, again, this idea of framing and media framing of Kaepernick's protests, especially as they relate to Carlos and Smith, is that Colin Kaepernick has had to spend quite a bit of time clarifying that he's not talking about the US military, US armed service members, veterans. He's been clear about what his objective is. And this isn't a critique of his protest. He has a clear objective. I want to talk about how, essentially, the ideals of freedom and equality have long been betrayed by the US government, by police forces, by white Americans, and that essentially we don't have an equal society as racial justice and police brutality continue to unfold seemingly without repercussion. So, and of course, Kaepernick, highly informed by the movement for black lives and providing a little bit of context along the way, some folks might be a little more familiar. So, but what I wanna make an intervention about with this image is thinking about how much Colin has had to really outline that he's not really talking about US militarism. And I think that's important in relation to Martin Luther King, because one year before his assassination in Memphis in 1968, in April 1967, at Riverside Church in New York City, Martin Luther King delivered his speech against the war in Vietnam. And he addressed the three evils of the world, economic exploitation, racism, and militarism, right? So it's, it's a powerful statement. And it wasn't necessarily well received, as we know, when thinking about, again, Lisa's work with the kind of, you know, how do we reclaim that radical king, right? How he's been whitewashed and all of that. But I'm thinking about this because it's seen, the taboo is so strong, right, in terms of framing about Kaepernick's protests. The taboo is so strong against critiquing US militarism and the war on terror. And I'm not saying that that's his responsibility, but I think it's something in terms of how we interpret the media's responses to these protests. Why, what, what's changed since 1968? You had a robust anti-war movement against the Vietnam War in 1968. We have this seemingly endless war on terror, right, where we discover in this seemingly clandestine sense that US troops are conducting military operations in Niger, conducting new military operations in Yemen and places that we had no idea, right? So there's a lot of things that have changed in terms of media coverage of war and military operations, but the kind of post 9-11 framework is important as well. So really thinking about why Colin Kaepernick, you know, his objective is clear, right? But what if you were to take a knee in protest of US militarism. What if you were to do that, right? And that's what's left out of the discussion in terms of the media framing, is that everyone says, many, many of Colin Kaepernick's defenders, sports writers, say he's not, this isn't against the troops, almost to say, don't worry. This isn't against, again, this idea of the troops, right? Not necessarily members of the US Armed Services, but thinking about US foreign policy, US militarism and the war on terror. So there's always kind of that qualification of we have to make sure it's not about that. And I think that discursive silence speaks volumes. So I thought that this juxtaposition was compelling and again, kind of placing Colin Kaepernick within this lineage of Martin Luther King. But I think thinking about Martin Luther King's opposition to militarism is particularly instructive for understanding the silences in the media coverage around Kaepernick and other players' protests. So I also wanted to bring up, um, this is from LeBron James' Instagram account, uh, so recently from February 16th. I am more than an athlete. I know folks have been following this story. And I'm not offering a comprehensive overview of African-American athletes and protests. I'm not speaking to all of that, but I think it's important is that we are in a moment in the last couple of years as spearheaded by Colin Kaepernick where this is getting a lot more visibility and discussion in the mainstream media. So again, we always have to kind of qualify what we're not doing when we present our work. But I wanted to ground that with that understanding. And another important disclaimer of sorts in terms of 
framing this discussion is NFL paid patriotism. And I hate to reproduce giant black texts like this, but it's important. So I want to make sure I'm accurate here. And some of you may not be familiar, but again, as this ongoing debate about Colin Kaepernick taking a knee during the national anthem before NFL games, uh, starting in 2009, and if you hear you know, conservative right-wing media, again, we have a much more polarized media, I'll address all this, than we did in 1968. There was polarization, don't get me wrong, but the media system is, is uh, vastly transformed. But looking at you know, the right-wing critiques of Colin Kaepernick, thinking about how dare you not stand for the anthem as if it was this time eternal tradition in the National Football League. Well, it's been a time eternal tradition since 2009, so less than a decade, um, have players been required to stand on the sidelines while the national anthem is played. So as Emma Niles reports in Truth Dig back in, uh, back in 2017 last year, um, she said the Department of Defense poured millions of dollars into the NFL in exchange for displays of patriotism during games. Until 2009, no NFL players stood for the national anthem because players actually stayed in the locker room. Um, explains Stephen A. Smith of ESPN. The players were moved to the field during the national anthem because it was seen as a marketing strategy to make the athletes look more patriotic. The United States Department of Defense paid the National Football League $5.4 million between 2011 and 2014, and the National Guard $6.7 million between 2013 and 2015 to stage on-field patriotic ceremonies as part of military recruitment budget line items. So that is... Definitely an important framing, right? And what's changed? What kind of structural changes have occurred? Um, differences between the NFL and, of course, the Olympic Games. So I wanted to, at the outset, make sure that that detail is known <laughs> before proceeding with this. So the story of this iconic image of Carlos and Smith and connecting the two. Um, so again, after the 200-meter final, the Olympic Project for Human Rights, uh, there was a proposed boycott, particularly because of the potential inclusion of a segregated South African team, which ended up not being included in the games back in 1968. And Harry Edwards, a sociology professor, was one of the forerunners and architects of the Olympic Project for Human Rights at San Jose State, and Tommy Smith and John Carlos attended. Uh, so at the end, Tommy Smith uh, wins gold with a world record time. As I mentioned, Peter Norman of Australia came in second, and John Carlos won the bronze. Um, and when they went to the dais, uh, both Carlos and Smith were wearing no shoes. They pulled up their black socks, and they said it represented black poverty, and had two gloves between them. Actually, John Carlos had forgotten his pair, and interestingly, Norman was the one who suggested that they split them. So this is a little fun fact. And Smith had the glove on his right hand, and Carlos on his left. Uh, Smith also wore a black scarf for Black Pride, and as I noted, Norman wore an Olympic Project for Human Rights pin. So it was eerily silent <laughs> during the playing of the national anthem, and then followed by jeers from the crowd. And the international and the International Olympic Committee and the U.S. Olympic Committee acted swiftly, uh, suspending them and forcing them to leave the Olympic Village. So that's the truncated story of what happened. So in the 2016 NFL preseason and regular season, uh, Colin Kaepernick, who was the quarterback, no longer significantly, for the San Francisco 49ers, had become involved and interested in the movement for black lives. And he sat during the anthem of the first three preseason games. So originally he was not taking a knee. Actually, originally he was sitting um, and went unnoticed for a couple of games and switched to kneeling during the final preseason game. And the person to note this, which actually asked Colin what was happening, was Steve Weish, who's a reporter for the NFL Network, who's also African-American. He first broke the story on August 27th, 2016, before the kneeling began. Um, and Colin was clear about the objective of his protest. He played 12 regular season games, uh, surrounded by much controversy. One of those regular season games was actually in my hometown of Buffalo, New York. Go Bills, I say that as a kind of confessional. Um, and then he opted out of his contract at the end of that year and remains a free agent, unsigned to any NFL franchise, despite comparatively impressive numbers. So, and that's, and that's unequivocally the case. So, and then in 2017, jumping forward, the ongoing story is that we have more than 200 NFL players, mostly African-American kneeling in response to Donald Trump's rebuke of their right to protest back in September. So we had kind of two waves of the story and I'm focusing mostly on that first wave in 2016 when it first broke because most of the media coverage I looked at 
from the 1968 protests were in the immediate aftermath. And I wanted to look at the immediate aftermath of Colin Kaepernick in 2016, because it's so important to sort of have that understanding of when the tone is set through the early coverage. So again, a little bit more context, obviously between these two, <laughs> these two years, you have seismic shifts in the media landscape, uh, an increased concentration of corporate media ownership, Ben Begdikian warned of the problems there many years ago, originally back in 1983, and we're still grappling with that. Uh, the decline of print media, of course, an increasingly fragmented audience, and far more openly partisan media platforms. So if you're, when I was looking through coverage of this, of the, of the Kaepernick protests and NFL player protests, Breitbart, Fox News, and other right-wing sites obviously are the most critical, right? So there's a more openly partisan media. And newspaper columnists are not as influential of opinion leaders. I'm thinking of opinion leaders as per Lazarsfeld and Katz, so social media as well. So you have the differences between the Vietnam War and the War on Terror, uh, black power movement and movement for black lives, and both occurred in contentious presidential election years. And I'm running out of time here, so I'll skip through my theoretical frames. And I gave a shout out to Todd for media framing. Okay. <laughs> I also wanted to encourage the work of other critical sports studies scholars who uh, follow these lines of inquiry. So again, this was qualitative in nature. Gauging tone was the primary objective. Um, I selected publications with US national audiences that were also in circulation at the time and isolated samples to the days and weeks following the incidents. So mostly analyzed Kaepernick from 2016. And a few themes emerged, of course, in 2017. And actually, the coverage became markedly more positive. So a quick note on demographics of sports reporters. And the key there is that they haven't changed much between 1968 and 2016. And you still only have about, from you know, 1968 to 2016, 5 or 6% of reporters are African American. And again, that's, again, working on a black-white binary. We're not getting a full picture with that data. But I want to point that out still. Especially sports coverage, still primarily white and male. So that has not changed. That is a parallel that is strikingly, strikingly still present. So, so just quickly on the findings. So the parallels and the lines of continuity, obviously these are two silent anthem-related acts of resistance for racial justice and human rights. They raise questions of patriotism in the coverage frequently, taboos on critiques of the military. I argue that this has deepened in a lot of ways since post 9 11 in different contexts, um, igniting debates about free speech, the relationships between politics and sports. And of course, the media regularly connects the events in this coverage. So almost every article when Colin Kaepernick first did this referenced Carlos and Smith, who also had brief NFL careers. I wanted to point that out. And all three have paid a professional and personal price for this. And have been in contact with each other and are in support of each other. So the points of rupture, again, uh, this is an interesting finding, was that perhaps unsurprising that reporters and columnists were far more hostile to Carlos and Smith, more tones of ridicule, apathy, and even omission, even not even covering the 200 meter final or mentioning what happened during the medal ceremony. Um, all the reporters were white males in the 1968 sample. Um, more diverse reporters covering Kaepernick's story at the publications under examination, but the staffs are primarily white and male writ large. Um, the tone with Kaepernick is far more sympathetic and balanced, um, but again, there is still that idea that everyone has to, in defense of his taking a knee, that it's not about militarism. And I think that that silence is important of why, of what does that mean, right? What, what do we make of that? Um, and opposition to Kaepernick is usually related to time, place, and manner restrictions. So supporting the right of the protest, but not during the anthem. And I think that's also significant in terms of the flag and the military being considered sacrosanct in the United States. So then if you're familiar with First Amendment law and time, place, and manner restrictions. Um, so, and then of course, Kaepernick more explicitly addressing concerns about military disrespect, more pressure to do so. And again, that discursive silence. So in conclusion, I just wanted to note that I'm not suggesting that in the coverage of Colin Kaepernick that you know, we should all you know, we should all give ourselves a pat on the back, right? Especially white folks that, yes, things have improved. That's not really, really the case here, but it is interesting to note those points of rupture and the ways in which perhaps there being a hint more diversity, particularly in sports reporters, um, covering Kaepernick's protest. And of course, the first person to break that protest was an African-American reporter, the first person to actually ask him and give him that platform and that voice. And that's significant. And um, Stephen Weish has said that much as well, but that's a lens through which he views things and how it's beneficial for him, especially in such a predominantly white field. So um, Kaepernick was runner-up for Time's Person of the Year, and also in retrospect, Time has been 
more kind and media coverage has been more sympathetic and understanding of Carlos and Smith as well. I think that's that's significant. And he was also named GQ's Citizen of the Year. So, uh, so we're still sorting out what to make of this, of how the coverage has been more sympathetic, but what does this mean in terms of what's happening in the media landscape? And not necessarily reflective of public opinion, which we can address at another time. So I know I'm way over time, so thank you. <laughs>